On this edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at Live One Day at a Time. The Our Father is very much a daily prayer, reminding us that the spiritual life is lived one day at a time. We need to, as Christians, learn to put in a good day, to, to, to not worry about tomorrow, but let today's own troubles be sufficient for the day. One of the great um, heroes of the Old Testament is the prophet Elijah. Elijah is the prophet of fire. And we know that St. John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. And Jesus says some beautiful words of affirmation about John the Baptist. I mean, here is Jesus, who is the Lord, who is the, the light of the world, and you get the impression Jesus was impressed with John the Baptist, because in John, Jesus says of John the Baptist, he says, he was a burning and shining lamp. Isn't that beautiful? That's what Jesus thought about John the Baptist. He was a burning and shining lamp. And we know that Jesus, in, in, in Luke chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus says, I have come to set the earth on fire, and how I wish it were already blazing. That's why Jesus came to this world. He came to set this world on fire with the Holy Spirit. And we know on the day of Pentecost, fire came down from heaven. Fire came down from heaven into the hearts and into the souls of the disciples. Isn't that a beautiful faith or a beautiful religion? You know, there's all kinds of different world religions. Ours is a faith where fire from heaven is sent down to burn within us. And this is a fire of love. It's a fire of joy. It's a fire of peace. How's that for a beautiful uh, faith, you know, one where, where fire is sent from heaven. And Jesus, of course, commanded us to, to be these lights, to be, become fire ourselves. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house, just so your light must shine. Jesus wants us to be filled with the light of Christ, the fire of the Holy Spirit, this holy fire, so that we can shine, so that we can radiate, and we can spread this fire to others. You've heard me share before, um, years, years ago, I came up with a goal in life or a personal mission statement or whatever. I was doing some reading, and different people were saying, you need to come up with a personal mission statement. You need to come up with a goal. Just like, you know, bishops, they have their motto. Every bishop has a motto. And so I did some thinking. I, the one I came up with is four words, become fire, ignite lives. And very much based on this imagery of Jesus coming to set us on fire. And those of you who've attended the Easter vigil, you know, we start with our with our... Easter candle, which represents Christ, the light in, that shines in the darkness, and then we take the light of the candle and we spread it throughout the church. And that's, an, again, an image of what each one of us is supposed to do um, as Christians. Now, another way of kind of describing becoming fire is what uh, one of my favorite authors, Matthew Kelly, calls becoming the best version of yourself. Have you ever heard that expression before? You're supposed to become the best version of yourself. Have you ever thought about what, what, would, what would the best version of yourself look like? What would the best version of yourself be like? That's what we're all supposed to come. And, and this, this is uh, one of St. Catherine of Siena, a doctor of the church, one of her most famous quotes. She says, Be who God meant you to be, and you will set the whole world on fire. You see, when the Lord calls us to holiness, when He calls us to perfection, when He calls us to become fire, when He calls us to let our light shine, all He's asking us to do is to simply be 
who we were made to be. It's a basic principle in the spiritual life. That's all God is asking of us. Nothing more. Simply be who you were made to be. In the, in the fullest sense, as a child of God, filled with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we know, of course, that each one of us has a very un- unique, an unrepeatable calling and mission in life. Each one of us, Scripture says, is meant to, to manifest the Holy Spirit, to be a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Scripture says each is given a manifestation of the Holy Spirit to the common good. And for each one of us, that's going to be completely unique. We are unrepeatable. No one was ever made like you or will be made like you. And so you have an opportunity to, to, uh, to, to let your light shine in a way that the world has never seen a star like this in the heavens before, to use another uh, biblical image. Now, as I kind of reflect on this call, this call to become fire, to be like John the Baptist and Elijah, to be uh, like John the Baptist, who again, Jesus says, he was a burning and shining lamp. I don't know exactly how that worked for Elijah and for John the Baptist, because I never met them. They lived a long time ago. We don't have a big, long, you know, uh, biography about their lives. It would have been very interesting to see how these men became such bright, shining lamps. But I'll tell you one thing that uh, I'm sure about. In our own lives, if we wish to become the blazing fires, the bright, shining lamps God is calling us to be, it's going to happen through patient perseverance. I think for each one of us, or for, for many of us, we can look back to a time in our life where the Lord ignited our lives, where He set our lives on fire. But that, brothers and sisters, that was only the beginning. It's like when uh, most of you, you've probably lit a fire before. Usually you start with a newspaper and kindling wood, and you throw a match on it, and, and it just starts to blaze. But you, you know that if you don't keep feeding that fire, it's going to die out real quick. It's going to die out as quickly as it started. Have you ever experienced that? Sometimes you put a little gasoline on. That'll really get it going. But boy, does it burn out quick unless you feed the fire. With the right size wood, you know, if you feed the fire with, with, with wood that's too big, it'll just, it'll not catch. If it's too small, it won't keep going or it won't really build into a big blaze. Um, but so too, uh, f- for each one of us, and again, in, in my own kind of walk with the Lord, with this desire to become fire, the Lord over and over again reminds me, this is only going to happen through daily, patient perseverance. There's no other way. There's no other way to really grow into the, the lights that the Lord is calling us to than, than, than this daily, patient perseverance. Moving forward, oftentimes, inch by inch, and also this, this, this walk towards, again, holiness, to become fire, to become light, to become love, is also one that unfortunately typically involves many falls. Again, part of, part of holiness is to be able to get up after you've fallen and keep moving ahead. That's one of Rocky. You remember, you know Rocky? <laughs> one of his big say- sayings. How does it go? He says, it's not, in life, it's not how hard you hit, it's how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. And boy, there's so much truth to that. Amen? If a person can get hit and keep moving forward, not going to get too far. That requires a patient perseverance, a humility, a resolve. Do we have that in our lives? I guess that's part of the reason it is good to come up with a personal mission statement or a goal in life, to keep reminding ourselves what I was made to do, what my goal in life is. When I'm dying on my deathbed, what is the one thing I want to have accomplished? And again, it'll only come through patient perseverance. Um, This is the secret to just about everything in life. You know, if if we want to... To, to, to do well in school, it's going to require 
perseverance. Now, it's true that in grade school and maybe even high school, some people are so smart they can just breeze through. But if we really want to excel in studies, maybe into college and university, it's going to take patient perseverance. The world of sports, you know, we know that the great athletes, they have natural talent, but natural talent only takes you so far. Every great athlete will say that. People will say, oh, you're such a great talent, you're so gifted. They'll say, yeah, right, I work hard. I've worked harder than anyone else. You'll, you'll hear many great uh, athletes say that. Even family life. You know, there are so many families that struggle. Many families fall apart. For a family to stay together, for a family to stay strong, it requires patient perseverance, daily patient perseverance. Amen? Again, there's just so many things in life to learn a language. Some of you might know I'm trying to learn Spanish. There's no easy way to learn Spanish. Father Miguel keeps saying all you need to do is eat, um, what are those peppers? Jalapenos. He says, eat jalapenos. You'll learn the Spanish like that. <laughs> if only it were so easy. Again, if we want to learn a language, it's only through patient perseverance. I mean, it's, it's true. Some people have an aptitude for these things, but even with an aptitude, you still, at, at some point, you still need to apply yourself through, through effort. And it, we could use so many other uh, examples. We will continue with the teaching by Father Mark in just a moment. The Food for Life ministry is only made possible by the financial donations from you, our viewers. We ask that after the program, you prayerfully consider a tax-deductible financial donation to help us continue this Catholic television ministry. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. Thank you for your prayers and support. And now back to Father Mark Goring. Let's look, let's look at one more example. Let's look at the example of a musical instrument. I did a Google search today. I wrote, how many musical instruments are there? And one of the answers that came up was some musical instrument expert who was researching this. Talk about, talk about uh, having too much free time. But anyways, um, <laughs> this expert says uh, there are between 1,500 and 2,000 official musical instruments. I guess instruments that are sold as instruments or whatever. And what, I, what this made me think of is um, not all of us are called to play the same musical instrument. Up in Canada, it's typical when you, you know, send your child to music lessons, you get them to learn the Piano. I guess it's the same down here. I, w I was having dinner with a family, and they, they were sending their, their young boy to piano lessons. And they said he was doing pretty good. He had an aptitude for it, but guess what? He didn't like playing the piano. Of the 2,000 musical instruments, I guess the piano wasn't the specific, precise instrument for him. He said he wanted to learn to play the drums. But I think the first thing, if we wish to become fire, is we need to discover what musical instrument am I destined to play? What musical instrument is perfect for me? It might not be the piano. Nothing against the piano. For some people, it is the piano. For some people, they, they, the first days, the first time their finger, fingers hit those ivory keys, they knew they were destined to play the piano. That's great. But not all of us. And so again, if we wish to become fired, if we wish to become the saints we're called to be, we need to discover exactly what it is the Lord is calling us to. Again, the life of St. Thomas Aquinas was di very different than the life of St. Therese of Lisieux, and much different than the li life of, of blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati. Every one of us is called to unique mission. Again, St. Catherine of Siena, be who God meant you to be, and you will set the world on fire. So again, what using the analogy of musical instrument, what musical instrument was I destined to play? What musical instrument, when I pick it up, I love playing it. Now, when you discover the perfect musical instrument for you, that, that, was, that, you, that it seems that it was made just for you, you will still have to work hard at learning that instrument. Even if you love whatever, you know, it is, 
if you want to become a great musician with that instrument, you must work at it. And so too for ourselves, you know, when we discover kind of what mission it is the Lord has called us to, and, you know, what, what, we, are, what we are created for, we still must apply ourselves through daily effort. And this is where the prayer of the Our Father comes in. The Our Father is very much a daily prayer, reminding us that the spiritual life is lived one day at a time. We need to, as Christians, learn to put in a good day, to, to, to not worry about tomorrow, but let today's own troubles be sufficient for the day. And in the Our Father, again, we pray, Lord, Father, give us this day our daily bread. Again, reminding us that this journey towards the promised land, towards heaven, towards union with Christ, is, is achieved, is, is lived one day at a time, one step at a time. And so, brothers and sisters, we're all on this journey together. This journey is a wonderful adventure. It's meant to be a joyful adventure. St. Philip Neri said, Souls that are joyful are much easier to lead to perfection than miserable souls. Again, this, this journey towards the promised land to perfection, we need to see it as a wonderful adventure. Becoming fire needs to be not a burden like piano lessons for some people. It needs to be something we can't wait for our next opportunity to play this wonderful instrument. So brothers and sisters, discover what you were called to play, how you were called to shine like no one else and pursue that with all your heart day after day. For an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Mark Goring on Live One Day at a Time, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of program 1883. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at, he knows us by name. And the whole point of this is that again, Jesus' love for us, our God's love for us is very personal. We belong to him. Scripture says he knows us by name and he will defend us. You know, my, my dad has lots of expressions, and one of the favorites that he has is, you know, there aren't really any new ideas. We just reuse other people's ideas. And I've realized that recently, that, that this inspiration I've had as of late, I inadvertently stole it from St. Paul. Let me explain. Recently, I ran a marathon. <laughs> yeah, a full... 26 uh, odd miles at my advanced age. I actually wasn't planning on running a full marathon. I, um, I thought I had gotten ahead of the curve and signed up in January. I was going to run the half, and even that was going to be a stretch, but the half was full. And so I had to sign up for the full marathon, the full 26 odd miles. And Obviously, there's a lot of uh, preparation to get ready for the marathon. I wasn't really a seasoned runner at that point, um, but I, f I felt something I wanted to do, and you know, I felt it was something maybe even God would have me do. And um, so, there's all kinds of uh, all kinds of training involved, and all kinds of different kinds of training. And in looking at training for a marathon, it's very much like the spiritual life. Like to train for the marathon, 
there's five or six different things you need to do to properly prepare to run a long distance. Number one, you have to run short distances at a fast pace. Because if you want to run a fast 42 kilometers, that starts with running a fast one kilometer. At the other end, you have to let your body get used to running a long distance. So you have to have a number of long runs um, before the race to get your body used to it. But you don't run the full 42.2 because that's just too hard on your body. And then you need to do special training for hills to train your body to basically, you know, build up your quads and your calves to get ready for hills. And there's other things too that you need to do in there. There's other things related to nutrition. You need to have the right amount of carbohydrates before you race. You need to be hydrated. And I couldn't help but think that all these five or six or seven different aspects of training for the marathon are not unlike the spiritual life. We don't do just one thing. We do six or seven different things to prepare and to stay in the race. So we, we pray and we fast and we take time alone. We have silence and we take silence and solitude and we do penance and we do acts of charity. We do a multiplicity of things to prepare for the race. Now, of course, this clever idea is not mine at all. St. Paul is 2,000 years ahead of me. And the reason why he used that analogy was, was for a more striking reason, not just for some, you know, social event uh, in a city, but because it had real meaning. And so we read from uh, 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul will use the analogy of a race. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So what's really important here is the historical context. Paul is writing to the Corinthians, the people in Corinth, which would be modern day Greece. Right? And the reason why this metaphor would be very strong to them is because is actually for the same reason, is the same sort of historical context for the origin of the marathon. That there was a runner who ran from Marathon, a place near the sea where there was a, a sea battle going on, and he ran to Athens to tell the people that the battle had been won. And it was a very important message, <laughs> you know, a life-threatening message. But he ran so hard and so far it took his life. And it's a very, very powerful metaphor because we run this race. And part of running this race is because we have a message. <laughs> and delivering this message will cost us our lives. Because Jesus says, if you want to gain your life, you must lose it. And so this man had this important saving message for the people to say that the battle has been won. <laughs> you will live. And he spent his life doing it. And so are we. We are to spend our lives in sharing the message of Jesus through our example and through sharing the message itself. But we do not run aimlessly. We train ourselves so we are to run this race, but we need to train for it at the same time. So there's things we need to do. So we have this, all of us are called to be marathon runners in the spirit. All of us have a message that we are to deliver and we will spend our lives delivering it. But to do that, to make it to our Athens from marathon 
we need to train. And so we need to, we need to pray. We need to serve. We need to be in fellowship with others. We need many things to be able to make it to our Athens, spending our lives sharing the message of life. Amen. I have a couple of notes to read to you today, and I believe they will bless you who so faithfully support Food for Life. The first viewer that has written in has written in from Manitoba and writes, Food for Life is very enlightening to me. Many of your teachings are what I really need. Thank you. Catholic programs are not numerous. It's like a desert here, spiritually speaking. We are planning to tape your program and share it with friends. A second viewer writes, a couple actually, and they say, enclosed is a donation to help spread the gospel of Jesus. Your ministry, Food for Life, has been spiritual food for us. Where we live, it is very dry in a spiritual sense. We are waiting on the Lord and need lots of encouragement. We've been taping your program for years. Thank you, and please, please keep the good teachings coming. You don't know how much it encourages us. And certainly these letters are an encouragement to us at Food for Life. When we hear this kind of feedback, it really just challenges us to continue on. The whole purpose of Food for Life is to share the words, the gospel of Jesus, because in His words are life and life-giving water. I think of the scripture in John 4:14. 4, Jesus Himself said, Whoever drinks of the water I shall give him will never thirst. The water I shall give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And that is so true. Spiritually, when we give our hearts and our lives to Jesus, we, not, we need not to be spiritually thirsty again. And that's the message we seek to convey on Food for Life. By God's grace, Food for Life is Canada's longest-running Catholic television program. That has been made possible through God's grace and provision, and God has used people like you to support us in your prayers and in your financial gifts. If Food for Life has been a blessing to you or has ministered to you in some way, and you would like to make a contribution to help us continue sharing these life-giving words, this life-giving water, we would invite you to write in to us at Food for Life. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1883 and today's topic, Father Mark Goring on Live One Day at a Time. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. We ask you to consider a regular monthly donation, either by post dated checks or through our website, to help us continue the Food for Life ministry. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at He Knows Us by Name. And the whole point of this is that again, Jesus' love for us, our God's love for us is very personal. We belong to Him. Scripture says He knows us by name and He will defend us. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry.